So good afternoon to all of you <coughs> and uh, greetings from uh, Ames Mangalgiri. <coughs> this is the uh, lecture or which was meant to be taken during the Antimicrobial Stewardship Symposium uh, by Vimeiro during the Microcon and because of some administrative issues and some issues with timings, the uh, lecture time was cut, cut down to just around 10 minutes so this I could not do enough justice for this particular topic and I was told by multiple people later on that please uh, <clears throat> try and upload this uh, uh, presentation and on your YouTube channel. So with that uh, I'd like to first of all uh, thank uh, Microcon for inviting me as speaker and uh, Biomiro for all their support uh, for, the tra for the travel and the stay and everything. I'm really grateful they've been very kind and helpful when it comes to our uh, after sale service. So, uh, we'll be talking about the clinical utility of MICs. Before that, I'll just tell you that uh, Ames Mangalgiri, where is located, because during the entire microcon, I was asked at where, where, where is Vijayawada, where is Mangalgiri, how do you, where is exactly. So, if you see the eastern coastline of uh, India, you'll see in Andhra Pradesh, there's a small notch over here. And right just above the notch is the, where the uh, Krishna River, it flows into the Bay of Bengal, is Vijayawada is located, right between Guntur, and uh, <clears throat> Amravati, so that's the location that we are coming from. And that is how our campus actually looks like. This is the east gate, the aerial view from the east gate. And <clears throat> we are located between the two hills. So that's why the name Mangalgiri, the auspicious hills, because there are a lot of temples of Bhagwan Narsing located on these hills. So these are, that's the name, the name Mangalgiri. So this is the east uh, aerial view from the east gate, and this is the aerial view from the west gate of our institute. That's aims written over there. That's all the hostel block and the administrative block. So that's the location of our institute. So <clears throat> just to declare that uh, when I was given this uh, particular topic to speak on, and when I saw the co-faculty with me, I felt like this uh, minion among the you know such huge people or such huge personalities. So that actually made me nervous during my session over there. But uh, thankfully, I'm not there right now. So. I'm much more comfortable, so that was my declaration. I'm really thankful and very honored that I've been able to give in a platform to speak among these huge stalwarts. So, <clears throat> just to give you a few examples of the pathetic AST reports from the clinicians, uh, for, the, to, for the clinicians to review on the microbiologists, you can even laugh at these reports, you can get angry at these reports, you can feel bad at these reports, or you can just let it go, just be indifferent as to what is there. So, this is one. This is the condition of the AST reporting that is existing as of today in our in our country, and this is from some uh, lab from North India where they reported E. coli from urine. And when the colony count, they've given a range. They've given a range of 10 power 3 to 10 power 5. So there's not a single count. They've given a range that is utterly unscientific. <clears throat> then they're given the incubation time period as 48 hours instead of 24 hours, so that they are over incubating the sample. So Urine is uh, your normally a non sterile site, so you are likely to get a lot of uh, other uh, uh, pathogens might overgrow. And of course, they have used the wrong drug plus combinations for E. coli, like azithromycin and tetracycline. And they have also reported the wrong drug uh, antibiotics for the wrong specimen, like azithromycin, chlorophenicol, and tetracyclines. And what is truly floxacin, miro penosalbactam combinations, amoxicilbactam combinations, you can see over here. Rubifloxacin and Miropenem Sulbactam, with all these, there are very weird combinations over here like this, which are reported. So these are totally unscientific, unrealistic, and as I call them, pathetic reports where they are signed by the consultant pathologists. And there is no criteria of interpretive reading over here because normally the AST report gives you a larger picture as to what is the pattern of the bacteria, what is the, what are the phenotypic resistance mechanisms which are present in that particular bug. Normally that is interpreted by the AST report, but since this is, in this case you cannot interpret anything right now. Same thing is for this kind of report also, as you can see this is unfortunate, this is an NAB accredited lab and that is a very again a bad condition because the AST reports are being validated by pathologists over here. <coughs> they are reporting drugs like amoxiclac, chloramphenicol again, all these drugs which are not to be reported in pseudomonas, they are reporting pseudomonas over here, all these antibiotics. And also drugs like chlorophenicol, tetracycline, ticoplanin also being removed for urine. Again, this is also the same NABL accredited lab. So that is the condition. Even NABL accreditation is not able to control these kind of pathetic reports. One has to be really very careful. So what I do is that actually you need to trash these reports. 
this is the condition when pathologists are trying to do the AST reporting for microbiology. So this is what they, they do. So you're supposed to trash all these reports in the black bin. Please keep that in mind. <clears throat> At the same time, unfortunately, some of our microbiology colleagues also are not too great solvers, I would say. Like they are reporting drugs like tyrosycline in blood and uh, they are even reporting phosphomycin without PKPD dosing for E. coli and MICO16. So in MICO16 they should have done a PKPD based reporting. So there are no basically, there are no uh, footnotes or no intrinsic resistance reports or no uh, uh, footnotes on what antibiotics not to report in what uh, uh, samples. Similarly, this again, this is a report by an MD microbiologist. Over here, you can see over here the concerned microbiologist reporting it as plus three plus two plus three plus. So this is all utter nonsense. So these kind of mathematical symbols are not to be present on the AST reports. Only the thing that you should you have is for maybe for for these kind of symbols, greater than or less than or maybe something like that, but not pluses and minuses. <clears throat> so why MICs? Why do we need MICs? Now, if you look at the overview of the pharmacological and the non-pharmacological factors which influence the therapeutic efficacy of any antibiotic, once you imagine yourself to be the antibiotic yourself and imagine your journey through the human body, you realize that every patient has got different size and shape and structure and body com com uh, composition, pregnancy or uh, you know, different uh, hemodynamic parameters. There are numerous extrinsic, extrinsic interactions also like food, alcohol, smoking, all uh, multiple parameters are there that influence your cytochrome P450 simulation and the metabolism of the drug. Then there are multiple things like what is the access to antibiotics, what is the timing, what is the level of care. So there are multiple factors which take care of the uh, journey of the antibiotic through the body and therefore the antibiotic first gets absorbed in the body like either by oral or the IV. The distribution of the antimicrobial agent, then again multiple things, they <coughs> are altering these distributions like renal replacement therapy or ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or there is metabolism by the cytochrome P450 or excretion of the antimicrobial depending on what is the GFR or the creatinine clearance that will influence the T half of the drug. So the greater the GFR, the lesser be the T half of the drug. Then protein binding of the antimicrobial, so if the albumin to globulin ratio is altered, so in that case the protein binding will also change because the free antimicrobial that is the one that actually brings about the pharmacological, uh, pharmacological effect in the, in, the, in the body that is the actual killing of the bug. Then of course the concentration of oxygen and the pH at the site, uh, concentration of the antibiotic will also uh, at the target site will also affect the outcome, what is the oxygen concentration, what is the pH, what are the different biofilms which are present, is there any vegetation or not, any implants or not. So all these factors they influence the pharmacokinetics. Uh, uh, the pharmacokinetics, what the uh, <clears throat> body does to the drug. And then in the end, the, uh, the whatever the amount of drug that is left at the site of the infection, that is the uh, concentration of site infection, then, we, then those parameters come as the, under the pharmacodynamic, which are the intrinsic resistance mechanism, the clinical MIC or the breakpoint zones, all these are the pharmacodynamic parameters. So we see it like this, if we can understand what is the basic PKPD, so PK is the absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination and the protein binding of the drug that is what the body does to the drug and the pharmacodynamics is the drug effects on the target pathogen in this case or the drug toxicity and the side effects what is the drug does to the body or the bacteria in this case so if we see this thing like if we give a dosage regimen then the antibiotic reduces a certain concentration of the serum which actually we actually measure then there is a concentration at the site of the infection. So these three parameters they constitute the pharmacokinetics. And then the ultimate biological effect that is exerted by the antibiotic at the site of infection, that is where the MIC plays the important role. So MIC is the most important uh, pharmacodynamic parameter that is uh, considered that is to be considered for effective uh, therapy of, of the antibiotics. <clears throat> so if you look at the current dosing systems. How efficacious they are, so we have got a certain fixed dose regimens and there are covariate based dosings like what we call as the anatomical therapeutic classification or defined daily dosing. So whenever we have an antibiotic we see that what should be the average dose, so with a fixed average dose especially for a drug with a wide therapeutic index. So therapeutic index basically defines the safety and it is not to be confused with the earlier term of therapeutic efficacy or the effectiveness of an antibiotic. So you must Keep in mind that therapeutic index indicates the therapeutic safety or the 
or how safe the drug is. So the drug which is a wide therapeutic index, you can afford to have the fixed doses like that where you can maybe have a, a slightly higher dose. But what uh, about the drug with, with the lower therapeutic indices? In that case, you have to uh, customize the antibiotic and then the concentration in vivo, that is the amount of drug which is distributed in the virtual space of the human body is the volume distribution. So the VD or the volume distribution is the virtual space inside the human body that is the where the antibiotic will distribute. So you cannot have equal uh, uh, dosages for people of different shapes and sizes and structures. Everybody will have different volume distribution and henceforth it is not wise to have the same dosing for all different structures of people. So that's why we need to tailor make our reports. So basically MIC is the highest dilution as you know it's the highest dilution or the lowest concentration which shows the no visible growth. So I have kept no visible growth in, uh, in, in, in the, uh, like this because uh, no visible growth means that means the growth could be there at 10 power 4 CFU per ml, growth could be there at 10 power 3 CFU per ml as well. So no visible growth is the parameter for checking the, so that's why it is not a true value because it's impossible to determine the true value because for the test challenge inoculum that we are using in our AST methods which is the broth micro dilution that is what is we are deciding. We are deciding a concentration of 10 power 5 CFU per ml but that does not <coughs> depict the true bacterial inoculum at the actual site. So it may be more, it may be less and that is the reason why we need to see, we need to check what is the amount of inoculum or what is the, how much growth is there in the, in the, in the specimen that we are getting whether it's a high inoculum infections or a low inoculum infection. So because source control is the most important method of controlling the infections. So the minimum uh, in, in the MIC is not a strict minimum but the observed minimum. So MIC if this is MIC 16 or less than 16 means MIC could be between 9 to 15 because there is growth at 8, there is no growth at 16 so that means it is between somewhere 9 to 15. So it is the observed minimum, it is not the actual minimum. And it does not represent the in vivo concentration, it represents the in vitro concentration. So what we said lower the MIC better the antibiotic, this is a myth, I will just tell you why this is a myth because MIC is not a single uh, number that decides the efficacy, it has to be uh, compared with the breakpoint uh, MICs which are there present for a particular drug, bug and drug combination and in some cases for different sites also like cefazolin. MIC therefore it's a phenotypic endpoint and it defined and standardized but a highly relative system. So what we are doing the MIC testing in our labs is actually a very defined system. It is an in vitro system, it is a static system. So it does not really replicate exactly what is going on inside the human body and therefore what is actually being measured in vitro is not exactly happening in vivo also. Therefore MIC as of now is still it's a it's still the nearest standard measure of activity of a drug against a bug. So despite of all these variations, all these variables, it is still the standard of activity of a drug against the bug. So and broth natural dilution is considered to be the gold standard over here. Now we all know that we there is a MIC and MVC is there. So MIC is the minimum inventory concentration where there is no visible growth and once we make a subculture from there, then once there is growth, then we call that the minimal bactericidal concentration. So now greater the MBC so and uh, greater the MBC and MIC ratio then it is a more of a static drug that is the usual convention but the MBC to MIC ratio will be less so this if this ratio if MBC is closer to the MIC in that case it is a very sidle drug it is killing the bacteria immediately but if this, this growth is still here in that case it is a static drug and the bacteria is being killed very very slowly. So that is the general or the usual convention that is the MBC to MIC ratio is less than 4 it is considered to be a sidle antibiotic and if it is more than 4 it is considered to be a static antibiotic but as during the uh, talk also Pallav Sarai also mentioned that it is more of a in vitro definition it is not a in vivo definition so it is just for the microbiologist's perspective not a actually clinical perspective because there are times when people ask clinicians ask them what is the MBC of a particular bug so that is not really to be you know uh, worth extrapolating into the in vivo. So generally greater the gap between the MIC and the MBC greater the chances that an antibiotic is static. So that is the usual convention but then again static drugs can be sidled in vivo and sidled drugs can be static in vivo depending on formation of biofilms or the concentration of the antibiotic at the site of the infection. <clears throat> so are MIC and, uh, MIC and dose they are both related together. 
so if we see how we decide on the dosing of an antibiotic is let's say first of all we have developed a new antibiotic the new drug against the gram negative bacteria let's say so first we'll check at what concentration is it able to kill the wild type strains so the wild type strains are strains which do not bear any kind of resistance to that particular antibiotic or or related to that class of antibiotic they don't have any resistance mechanism so those are the wild strains and what is the concentration of the antibiotic in those wild strains that becomes our epidemiological or the wild type or the microbiological cutoffs so once we decide that okay these are the epidemiological cutoffs but can we achieve that concentration in the human body or not so then we go in for animal studies and determine the toxic doses and therapeutic doses and therapeutic index and all those things and then we decide whether how at what concentration are we achieving toxicities and what is the therapeutic index so at what high higher the concentration there is no is there is no toxicity that means it's got a very high therapeutic index so in that case we decide at so what dose it is not toxic to the animal and what up till what dose can we go so we determine the maximum safe drug dose concentration and then we do the pkpd studies and we using oral uh, formulations and parenteral formulations and then we see uh, multiple concentrations at different types see the trough levels achieved after the third dose fourth dose fifth dose and then we go into clinical trials and then that is how we decide the clinical cutoffs by deciding checking on the uh, concentration achieved in the blood and whether that concentration is easily able to kill the non wild type strain so there are certain the clinical strains that we get whether that concentration achieved is able to kill the non wild type strains also so first we decide the wild type strains or the epidemiological cutoffs if the epidemiological cutoffs are very very high so in that case it is not responding the, that bacteria will not get killed by that particular antibiotic so there is no point of delving the drug further because to achieve those epidemiological cutoffs in the body will require much much higher concentration of the antibiotic which will be toxic for the humans in themselves so we stop at this that's why we need to check for the epidemiological cutoff first before we actually measure this is like developing a scale so once you develop a scale then we see that at, with, at that scale can we reach those concentrations in the human body or not so this is the appendix e that is given clsi m100 as you can see that we have got uh, this is the antibody that is given this is the mic or the breakpoint mic and against that mic what is the concentration that has been decided this is the safe concentration against which if we get a uh, bug which is got mic of this and less in that case it will respond clinically uh, to this particular antibody however if the mic is slightly higher like for example in cefepime the mic is 2 over here the usual mic for for uh, for intramaterials if it is higher mic then we need to increase the antibody dose or the antibody duration or the antibody concentration depending on whether it's a time dependent antibody or a concentration dependent antibody or at times even for the time dependent antibodies also we can increase the dose of the antibody so depending on the mic so once we have validated the doses of the antibody against these mic's then these doses or these mic's they become our uh, susceptible dose dependent mic so these are the validated uh, uh, mic's against particular uh, known concentration or increased concentration using clinical trials so these are the known as the sdd at the same time what ucas does is ucas is not going to all these complexities what ucas does is when the mic is the susceptible breakpoint zone you use standard dosing when the when the mic is in the intermediate zone or what they call as the susceptible with increased exposure breakpoint range in that case we use the high dosage that is given in the ucas tables very clearly and along with the special situations where you need to change the dose and concentration depending on the site of the infection so that's the difference between the ucas and the clsi now this is a typical concentration to time uh, uh, curve that for a classically a single dose of an antibiotic if we give an antibiotic to a patient it start the concentration immediately increases and then it falls like this over time so this is the time concentration of an antibiotic and this is the total amount of antibiotic that is given to the patient during that time so if you see if this is the mic of an antibiotic let's say so from this duration to this duration the concentration of the of the of the antibiotic is above the mic right so depending on or naturally the antibiotic will act only usually when it is above the mic only that's the minimum inhibitory concentration but what happens with two kind of antibiotics 
one class is the concentration dependent antibiotic which are our amino glycosides and quinolones which are the classical examples because they have got a good post antibiotic effect they kill the bacterial genetic machinery and therefore they are given in a high concentration they reach at a peak they kill the bacteria as much as possible and then they have got a good post antibiotic effect primarily because of the uh, killing of the bacterial genetic machinery and because of slow elution of the antibiotic from the protein bound uh, when the, from the protein bound antibiotic slowly gets eluted during the uh, during the next phase so it keeps on slowly eluting and that keeps on killing the bacteria so that they have got a good post antibiotic effect at the same time then there are time dependent antibiotics like typically for the beta lactam drugs or our carotenems all are time dependent antibiotics so their concentration has to remain above the MIC for a longer duration of time so the exposure of the antibiotic is more important rather than the concentration of the antibiotic but at the same time always this parameter remains constant in both the type of, uh, kind of uh, antibiotics that's the concentration dependent and the time dependent then there are a third class of antibiotics which have pro got the properties of both time dependent and uh, concentration dependent antibiotics like glycopeptide and, and lysozolate so these have both the properties so you can increase the dose as well as the frequency so in the concentration dependent antibiotics you need to have a single dose and a high dose at one time that will take care of the many there are many advantages because if you keep on giving amino glycosides in repeated dosing of as bd or tds so there will be more renal toxicity or ototoxicity but at the same time the same total amount of antibiotic given as a single dose at one time there will be lesser ototoxicity and lesser nephrotoxicity and better killing so that is why always all the myoglycosides and fluoroquinolones they have to be given as OD doses or maximum as BD doses myoglycosides have to be given as BD doses only in cases of uh, rare cases like uh, cystic fibrosis where you have to kill the pseudomonas originosa so this is what the clinician uh, asked us many times that which is the most effective antibiotic in your HT report that's a very common question so the general is that they ask you which is the largest zone that you have got so if I say the zone of vancomycin is, is let's say 21 and the zone of ciprofloxacin is 35 so they are starting with 35 is 3 plus so all these reports from private labs they are all nonsense totally rule out these reports don't believe these reports with pluses and minuses so how we decide what is the most effective antibiotic what you can do is either you can use the ratio of MBC to MIC because smaller the ratio it is sidle the more the ratio it is static so you might think that the but again as I said this is more of an in vitro definition it is not an in vivo definition so that is why you cannot and you cannot measure MBC every time because you will have to do broth macro dilution or tube macro dilution which is a very very tedious method on a daily basis same time the ratio of C max to MIC you might think that the higher concentration that is reached then the more efficacious the antibiotic would be but that is not suitable for the beta lactam antibiotic which are the time dependent antibiotics similarly therapeutic drug monitoring at the site of infection you actually measure the concentration of the antibiotic at the site of infection and then you compare it with the MIC it is the ideal thing but it is very very impractical because PDMs you have to collect the drug after certain doses at certain trough levels and transport them in special tubes and transport in, in within a very few seconds so that the drug does not get metabolized during the transportation then what we call as a susceptible MIC breakpoint is to the MIC ratio so this is let's say we know what breakpoint MICs are breakpoints are basically concentrations of which separate the bacteria so the susceptible breakpoint MICs are the ones below which the bacteria is likely to respond so like for example if we got a susceptible breakpoint for certain antibiotics and we got the MIC achieved so that ratio is the most effective ratio or the you can say the breakpoint MIC quotient is one of the most effective methods in the new methods of uh, checking your uh, eff efficiency of an antibiotic so if we were to check if you were to uh, no, uh, talk about breakpoint to MIC quotient this is a parameter that is evaluated, evaluated in this particular paper earlier it was uh, called as therapeutic index but that's the wrong term so we have now sticking to breakpoint to MIC quotient or the BMQ that is the standard parameter to evaluate the efficacy of an antibiotic that is the ratio of the susceptible breakpoint MIC is to the MIC achieved by the particular uh, strain against a particular antibiotic so MIC and the MBC do not completely predict the bactericidal nature of the antimicrobial agent patients with pathogens having MIC near the clinical breakpoint experience a higher risk of clinical failure 
So the break point, if your break point MIC is two and your MIC of the antibiotic is also two, then there is a higher chance of clinical failure. I'll tell you why. Why the clinical failure is there? So this particular study it hypothesized this new ratio known as the break point to MIC quotient that is very effective because. Like I said, that higher the, uh, the lower the um, uh, MBC, the better the antibiotic it is, right? So uh, minimum bactericidal concentration, the lesser or closer it is to MIC, that means it is likely to respond very nicely. So this is the comparison that is done between the breakpoint to MIC quotient versus the MBC using the E-test and broth dilution, and they have found that there has been an inverse ratio higher the uh, lower the uh, MBC, better is the BMQ. So technically, higher the BMQ, the more chances of the therapeutic efficiency or the clinical efficacy of an antibiotic is present. So this is a good indicator for the therapeutic efficacy of an antibiotic. So if you see what exactly go, if we delve more into details of what a BMQ is, BMQ, like I said, is the breakpoint to MIC quotient. It is misinterpreted as therapeutic index. So as I said that earlier, it was used to call the therapeutic index in some uh, in some books or some literature. But actually, therapeutic index is the level of drug safety. BMQ measures the therapeutic efficacy of an antibody, and it is better valid for blood culture because that is where we are actually measuring the concentration of the antibody. So if you see these MIC guiding tables, which are provided earlier by Biomiro also, so if you see these are susceptible breakpoint MICs, which are present as per the CLSI or the UCAS concentrations. So this is susceptible breakpoint MIC and once we take the ratio of these, so we can find out what is the best effective drug. Just to give you an example of a particular case, one of my friends, he sent me a report of a Vitek report of a joint aspirate that had isolated Escherichia coli and that he sent me the Vitek report and I told him that what to do, he said that let me know what is the best antibody that I can give. So that was at almost two years ago, so that time I used the term therapeutic index so that's not the right term, it's breakpoint to MIC quotient. So when I made the breakpoint to MIC quotient report for him, then I told him that going for, this is the blowout of the same report, so I, I told him to go for Pepicillin, Tazapartum and Gentamizin combination. Or if it does not respond, give it an antibody timeout. The usual antibody timeout that we get is 48 to 72 hours. But since this is a bone and joint infection, I told him to give an antibody timeout of approximately 2 weeks over here. So it does not respond to Pepicillin, Tazapartum and Gentamizin combination. In that case, shift to meropenem and amikacin. He said, I don't know, you tell me exactly what is the exact how to give the antibiotics. I don't know what to give, where to give, and how, quick, how soon to give. So I made him a dosing recommendation chart, which we call as the antibiotic pathology. So I told him to give peptocin as a factor of 4.5 gram every 8 hourly, total dose of 13.5 gram as a daily dose, as an extended infusion of 3 hours per dose and use the infusate as directed by the manufacturer. Like if the pepicillin azobactam manufacturer says use 0.5 normal saline or regular lactic dilute in that in 100 ml or 200 ml and make the concentration accordingly. And the infusate must be delivered uh, 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 the 4.5 gram in not less than 3 hours dose. And, and to give jetamycin 5 to 7 mg per kg day a single dose in the morning only. And uh, just an hour, around 30 minutes and from the same line you can infuse the pepicillin tazobactam also. This is the first line of drug antibiotics I told him, this is the second line of antibiotics I told him. Then after, this is personalized antibiotic reporting, uh, what we also do at Ames Mangalgiri over here. So he responded to me that after 3 weeks post op now zero markers have come down to almost normal. Stitches are dry and removed, the, clinically the knee is silent. Uh, patient could be given gentamized for 7 days as creatinine has started to increase now. So, after three weeks, after three weeks of an OD dosing, then the creatinine starts rising. So that is the advantage of giving OD dose that the kidneys remain safe. Okay, the kidneys remain safe in OD dosing. So we discussed and we uh, gave him multiple uh, references to go in for the full paper as to what the IDSA guidelines say about the prostate joint infection. And then we weaned the patient to oral antibiotics. In this case, the pro was susceptible. So we went in for 750 gram a milligram BD orally, that was the as recommended by the IDSA guidelines. So that is how we do the personalized antibiotic reporting in our hospital settings. This is a report of MRSA showing, uh, so this is basically uh, a case of MRSA infection from the surgery department where we uh, told that in this case, TECO plan because it's got a very, very high breakpoint to MIC quotient of 16. So we told the uh, clinicians to go for TECO plan along with amikacin. 
dosing also in this case. <clears throat> Despite the fact that Tico and Vanco have got the same MIC, still we went in for, for Tico current because the breakpoint to MIC quotient of Tico is much higher than Vancomycin. So despite the Vancomycin being the drug of choice for MRSA, we should ideally now switch on to Tico planin. This is again a HUNET uh, based report from a previous institute showing intermetric loiki that was reported in uh, September 2021 where it is a partially derepressed strain where it is resistant to third generation cephalosporin, it is resistant to cephalosporin also but it is susceptible to peptidin dazobatum and gentamicin. We did not report carbonyls because carbonyls are further known to increase the problem and uh, uh, no, induce the resistance to uh, uh, carbon resistance also. So in this breakpoint to MIC quotient report that we made, we uh, did not report cholesterol, we did not report ertapenem, we did not report any other carbonyls over here and we report just peptidin dazobatum and gentamicin again same as Three, uh, as a you know, three hour infusion for slowly for to present as a So we can use that as all these as carbon sparing strategies. So there are situations where we have to overrule the BMQ concept. Okay, the BMQ concept when it can be overruled because this is the use of BMQ itself is not a standard practice, but based on drug or the bug or the patient profile and the customized AST reporting needs to be done, and then we have to rule out. So there are certain Despite the fact that the BMQ may be less than 1 or even as low as 0.25 times what we call an SDD, so even that time we have to rule out the uh, concept of breakpoint to MIC quotient. There are times when you can give only the drug of choice as per guidelines. If the guidelines say vancomycin to begin for MRSA, then despite the fact that Ticoplan is more, we can go in for vancomycin because vancomycin uh, BMQ may be 4 or more than 4. When we are planning synergistic therapies, like for example, if you want to go in for carbonyl sparing options and your com combination antibiogram says that the combination of peptidin and azobatum along with the microgracite has got 97% susceptibility as compared to a meropenem alone which has got a 87% susceptibility. So in that case, you can go in for a peptidin and azobatum combination despite the breakpoint to MIC quotient being less than 1. When we are planning the PKPD based dosing, example increased frequency or extended infusion or continuous infusion in case of the beta lactam drugs or higher than usual doses. So we can go as high as 30 mg per kg per day as a single dose also for Amiga cell. Whenever we got not much choice, example like for example there are carbapenem resistant proteas. Now in carbapenem resistant proteas what do you do? You can't give carbapenem because it's resistant. You can't go in for nitrofurantoin for urinary samples because it's intrinsically resistant. You can't go in for cholesterol again because it's intrinsically resistant. So what do you do? So most of the cases, peptidin and tazobatum, the BMQ, whether peptidin and tazobatum MIC is in the intermediate range, in that case, you go in for the PKPD based dosing. So increase dose and increase frequency with a continuous or a, you can say the uh, uh, extended infusion you can go in for or when there is a poor benefit, the, if you see, if you talk about the, uh, the toxicity is to the recovery or the, benefit, the risk to benefit ratio, if you see, if the, if the benefit is very bad, so in that case you have to go in for a drug with a lower breakpoint to MIC quotient. Or the sites where the antibiotic is not concentrated or the not suitable for the patient, in that case also, but like for example, Tysagene might have a BMQ of let us say 8. But if it is a blood sample, we can't give a tie cycle at all. So that's why the antibiotics which are not concentrating as side infections in that cases, we don't go in for uh, this BMQ concept. This is another report of an AMC beta lactam is uh, in the uh, enterovitric cloaky. Again, we have uh, it is susceptible to third generation cephalosporins, but we have reported only uh, uh, peptidin and tazobatum. We have told it more of peptidin and a gentamicin combination. So there are certain particular drug bug combinations which are inappropriate for given site of infection despite the breakpoint uh, uh, break MIC quotient being higher than one like I said for tricycline for CSF samples also like first I, this, uh, this is given for specifically for CSF uh, I, uh, uh, CSF in table 1b of M100 the first second generation cephalosporins, cephamycins, cholesterol all these antibiotics are not to be given in CSF despite BMQ being more than one or Isolate from abscesses where the oxygen concentration is very low or anaerobic infection, we don't give aminoglycosides because their entry is oxygen dependent. Lungs, we don't give dactomycin because they get sequestered. 
by the pneumocytes urine we don't give these antibiotics because they are not concentrated over there and of course beta lactams ideally not to be given for lower uti so that is why we insist very specifically whether the patient whether the pain is from loin to groin or a suprapubic pain so that is why you have to be very careful when you taking the history again this is a similar summary what are the antibiotics to report from sites uh, from specific sites only and what are the antibiotics that are not to be reported uh, in certain patient populations and at the same time this is a very interesting concept of the uh, mutant selection window and which is why i was telling you that the the closer the mic is to the susceptible breakpoint the higher are the chances of clinical failure that is why we say that vancomycin mic is if a two uh, if the vancomycin mic is two for staph aureus despite the uh, breakpoint being uh, <clears throat> despite the breakpoints being uh, 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 close to the mic so they may not uh, work very well so in this case what we need to see is that the ms that the mutant mutation selection window is an antimicrobial concentration range that extends from the mic required to block the growth of wild type bacteria up to that required to inhibit the growth of the least susceptible single step mutant so we know that for tuberculosis we have got numerous uh, we got we have to give a 6 month therapy or 8 month therapy 9 month therapy at times reason being because of few selected mutants which might remain in the site of infection at the site of infection they might outgrow so that is why we have to give a drugs multiple drugs with multiple synergies so that all the bugs are covered but what happens what about a single antibiotic so we have to give an antibiotic at a concentration c max so there are certain isolates which are mutants that remain above the mic but below the mpc that is the mutation prevention concentration so at the mutation prevention concentration this is the site where the antibiotic resistance actually happens and once the bugs are some of the bugs are there in the mutation selection window and if you are not keeping the concentration four times the high uh, above the mic in that case these mutant mutants are likely to develop and that is why we have to have a despite for even for uh, time dependent antibiotics we have to have higher uh, concentration over there this is another example of a salmonella typhi report uh, from a previous institute we have reported only azithromycin p plus nalidic acid cotrimoxazole clonifenicol and pn ciprofloxacin and over here as you can see we reported only ampicillin and cotrimoxazole we are withholding the result of ciprofloxacin why because the ciprofloxacin mic is only one the breakpoint uh, the, the the breakpoint mic is only one so the bmq becomes one so the breakpoint the breakpoint mic and the susceptibility breakpoint mic is just this ratio is only one they very close together so the chances of mutation developing is very high and that is why we get cases like this septrazone treatment failure because they are giving septrazone 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 for these kind of cases and septrazone mic's are close to the breakpoint mic so that is why these mutations develop and we get esbl positive salmonella type so certain fundamental basics to remember just to uh, uh, that you need to alter dose primarily that altering the dose primarily affects the cmax to mic ratio and the area under the curve to the mic ratio and altering the dosing interval or duration affects the AUC to MIC and the percentage of MIC. <coughs> For time-dependent antibiotics, the rate of bacterial killing is maximized at low, low multiple of the MIC and achieving higher concentrations does not result in greater killing. For concentration-dependent agents, an increase in the volume distribution will reduce the ability for a standard dose to achieve a high max, high uh, C max concentration. So I just skip this slide. Now this is very interesting. What what we call the front-loading doses. So if the MIC, let us say MIC is eight, and if I am going for time-dependent antibiotic, if I am going for slow infusion, continuous infusion, so to reach that concentration in the antibiotic it takes nearly eight hours. So what during these eight hours, what we need to do is we have to keep the patient safe. So for these eight hours, we give a shoot, uh, we give high concentration antibiotic, and that takes care of the uh, uh, the 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 bug in the initial eight hours. And we give a loading dose and then a maintenance dose that maintains the MIC of the antibiotic. So uh, this is what happens when you don't give a loading dose for time-dependent antibiotics. This is the uh, time period where the patient is likely to succumb to infection. So we have to give a loading dose in such cases. <clears throat> so uh, I'll just go. I'll just brief through this thing. What are Bayesian dosing softwares? So what we call as Bayesian dosing is based on the Monte Carlo simulations. In a community, what are the different uh, parameters like what is the average protein binding, 
what is the average uh, creatinine clearance, what is the average multiple PK parameters, so all average, all these PK parameters for the community in normal human being are taken, they are collected and collated in a software known as the Monte Carlo simulations and using those Monte Carlo simulations we can make these softwares for the Bayesian dosing and depending on the MIC, depending on the creatinine clearance, depending on the age and the weight of the patient and depending on what is the percentage of target treatment you want for a particular antibiotic, you can have different Bayesian dosing soft, uh, curves like this is the probability of target attainment of 0.9 so in that case the concentration if we give a continuous concentration if we give a 24 hour OD continuous infusion if we give in that case even with 6000 milligram we can achieve concentration above the MICs whereas if we use 500 mg uh, as one hourly three times a day in that case you can just have this, this much amount of exposure to the antibiotic and the percentage of target attainment is just zero over here. So despite also that's the why we need to do the uh, continuous infusions. So for the clinicians we need to use the antibiotic judiciously, we need to have patience, we need to give beta lactam drugs slowly over 3 to 4 hours, collect the cultures first, assess the enemy, change I will do oral as, as early as possible, discuss with the clinical microbiologist and the AMSP team and please realize that automation is not the same as auto analysis because just getting the MIC value is not enough, we have to interpret the MIC values based on the breakpoint to the MIC quotient. So the take home message is that we need to ask for the MIC values, it has to be mandatory for drugs like vancomycin, colicin, netilomycin. You have to report the breakpoint to the MIC quotient and all blood isolates or all other sites and use the clinical judgment. MIC in the intermediate category, then you have to judge whether it's a time dependent antibiotic or a concentration dependent antibiotic or if the overall concentration needs to be removed, have to be, have, has to be raised. You have to convince the clinicians to administer all beta lactam drugs as and carbarians as external infusions only of 3 hours and above, never as 30 minute bolus doses. So thanks to all my faculty, co-faculty and uh, gratitude to everybody, especially to Biomero who have sponsored uh, for this particular uh, uh, stewardship uh, uh, symposium. Thank you so much.